So today, Zach Garza is going to tell us about the atom spectral sequence. So take it away, Zach. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul, again, for, for putting this together. It's been really fun. Uh, so yeah, I'm hoping to discuss a little bit about the atom spectral sequence today. Um, I think this is like one of the, the more uh, computationally heavy tools we have to attack, you know, questions about you know, computing actual homotopy groups and particularly like stable homotopy groups. Um, so for example, this is sort of the, the powerhouse way to get at, um, you know, stable homotopy groups of, of spheres. Um, so just want to set a couple of things up um, as we get started. Uh, the big thing is that we're going to be working in a particular uh, homotopy cat category of spectra. So the model will take is uh, sequential sec spectra and we'll take the uh, homotopy category of that. Um, maybe refer to this as just SHC, the stable homotopy category uh, throughout um, by equipping it with this, this stable model structure. Um, just a quick reminder of kind of what's going on with that. We have some fibrin objects in the form of uh, omega spectra. The weak equivalences are kind of the obvious thing, the things that induce isomorphisms on uh, homotopy. Um, and we'll write the, the morphisms in this category with this, this square bracket notation. Um, so it's like homotopy classes of maps between spectra. Um, and it's worth keeping in mind, I may leave off um, sort of a subscript here, but these things are, are graded. Um, so they're, I guess, technically there should be kind of like a, you know, a star or an index there to keep track of that. Might leave it off. Um, a couple of things that are going to show up. Uh, we'll need to talk about, so I'm using slightly non-standard notation here, but this is a the p completion of the integers. You might usually see it with the, the hat up in the superscript, uh, but later on we'll be taking like smash powers of things. Uh, so I just move the hat down. Uh, so the p completion of the integers, uh, sometimes also known as the chaotic integers, just what you obtain by looking at all these these quotient groups, z mod b to the n, uh, and taking a, a limit of that system, an inverse limit. Um, something that may also come up, um, it's worth distinguishing here, is that there's also the p local integers. So similar construction, except you're, you take the ideal generated by p, you localize that in the usual ring theoretic sense. Um, sorry, you just yeah, perform usual ring theoretic localization where your ideal is pz. Um, and one way you can think about that is just there's a calculus of fractions for it, where your uh, two elements, you can write q here, but these should probably be I guess that's fine. These are rational numbers just where uh, P doesn't divide the denominator. Uh, and it's worth mentioning because this will come up uh, in a moment here that there's some kind of like duality between these in the sense that um, so you can, there's a, there's a process for P completing a space and the effect it has is to P complete all the homotopy groups. And one way you can achieve that is by localizing category spectra at um, the more mod P more spectra mod p more spectrum. Um, and it accomplishes exactly this, just that the homotopy groups of your new space um, are the p completion of the homotopy groups of your old space. And one way you can realize this is just to tensor your, your old group with, um, with the uh, with z completed at p. And then uh, won't be as, won't come up as much here, but you can kind of do the dual thing um, localizing instead. And this localization is at now the uh, eisenberg mclean spectrum HFP. Uh, by the way, these Ls are mouse field localizations, and that just has the effect of um, localizing your uh, homotopy groups, which you can also realize as a, a tensor. Uh, so for most of what we're doing today, um, P will be pretty much any prime, and it seems like most of these constructions will go through uh, with other primes, but it seems a little bit more, um, a little bit more detailed. Uh, for the most part, we'll just be thinking about P equals two. Uh, let's see if we can get a lot of mileage out of just looking at that. And uh, kind of the goal of the agenda for today is I'm hoping to construct the atom spectral sequence um, to kind of see what goes into to building it. And um, at the end, to work out an example of um, the one line on the E2 page for a specific case of taking um, X to be X and Y, um, two things that'll be appearing in the spectral sequence, the both be the sphere spectrum. And we'll be taking, um, HF, HF2, the mod 2, uh, and the with main spectrum. So I think one of the, yeah, maybe maybe just to frame, like, what does the spectral sequence actually do for us? Um, we have these morphisms in this category, just homotopy classes of maps between spectra. Um, how do we compute 
any of these. It's kind of the main question. Um, and this immediately reduces to a really hard question. If you just take both of these to be the sphere, spec sphere spectrum, um, you're essentially computing stable homotopy groups of spheres. Um, so that's a hard problem. Uh, you can also just think of Y just being an arbitrary spectrum and just take X to be the sphere spectrum. And now you're computing homotopy groups of, of Y. Um, and so the strategy to kind of get at computing these morphisms is, um, so I'll write H star, uh, maybe I say this later, H star will be taking homology with um, FP coefficients. So for us, F2. Um, and what that does is, you know, if we have a map between spectrum, A maps to B via F, we apply H star, um, you know, it's functorial, so we land in some category, we get a map between H star of A and H star of B and some map. Um, and a priori, you might just get something that's like a, say a graded, uh, Z graded FB module, um, but there'll be more structure on this. Um, we'll actually land in Z graded A modules where A is the mod B scheme rod algebra. So we have homology to kind of go one way. And the idea is um, hopefully we can say, so this is like a much more, uh, I don't know, it's a somehow more structured category maybe. Um, and then we can sort of just do homological, it's, it's a category of, um, modules. So we can just do kind of traditional homological algebra over here. Um, and the idea is hopefully maybe we can kind of run this machine backwards um, to compute something about homologies and then um, work backwards and say something about the, the morphism of spectra we started with. So that's kind of what the atom spectral sequence uh, tries to do. So kind of pictorial sort of representation over here where A modules are somehow like a more rigid category. Okay, so the strategy, um, how we're gonna do this is, well, we're gonna try to cook up a spectral sequence, um, hopefully converging roughly to uh, the homotopy classes of maps. And this, this roughly is because we'll have to do some, some kind of peak completion thing uh, to get it going. Uh, we'll identify the two page, um, you know, be an FB module, it's an FB vector space. Um, and we'll find it has, uh, the structure of a module over this D naught algebra instead, and that's an abelian category. And um, now we can do things like try to compute projective or injective resolutions, take drive functors, that kind of thing. Um, the C2 page, what we'll try to do is actually identify it as the derived functors of, of some HOM in this, this category A mod. Um, so just the right derived functors of HOM into something. And uh, what we'll essentially show is that. Um, what the E2 page is, is doing is essentially constructing the, the projective resolution you would use to compute this, this X group. Um, okay, and the, the way we'll sort of do this is um, we'll take Y as you know just some arbitrary spectrum that we wanna know about. We'll compute some kind of tower that uh, resolves it in some sense, um, where after you apply say some homology theory E star, uh, you actually get a projective resolution of E star Y from all of this E star of the, the tower lying above it. And once we've done that, then hopefully we can kind of play all of these structures against each other, the A module structure and the fact that it's an X group, maybe multiplicative structure coming from the fact that it's on an E2 page um, to maybe identify some generators in this thing. So generators will, will come from the steam rod algebra. We have some generators there. And then it's just a matter of figuring out um, these things survive to the e infinity page. So do they, are they permanent cycles or not? And that's kind of the hard part, I guess. We can find some things, um, but it's, it's yeah, it's not easy to say if they if they live beyond E2 or E3. And it's also, I mean, maybe in complete generality, you'd want to sort of compute all of the permanent cycles, all of the differentials. Um, but I think already once you get to E2, there are a lot of hard problems there. Uh, so maybe before, Oh, so this is this is a very a really minor thing, but I don't think that the E two page is a is an A module. Um, oh really? I think even if you take Homs between two A modules, you don't. Uh, that doesn't have an A module structure because A isn't a commutative ring. It, it, I think you also do get an A module structure if you have uh, some extra structure on the algebra and the modules or something like if it's a hop algebra or something like this. Wait, really? Oh. Uh, there's something like that, but I don't know if it okay. holds here in general. So commutative ring is one way to get it, but, okay. um, but there's, I think also a, 
in general, HOM modules over an arbitrary ring, though you, you're right, does not have a module structure. I'm sorry, I, I could be misremembering something. Bob told me so many things over the years. So they no, it's okay. I, I could be, uh, yeah. What? But it, but it's, I mean. Can I ask, so is it a co-module over A? Well, it's, it's HOMs between two A modules. Um, or it's, I mean, it's, it's X between two A modules is what it is. So I think, I mean, that has, in the case where you're computing the homotopy groups of spheres, that's a ring, for example, um, because you can sort of multiply together X classes, but. Um, so that yeah. uses, that, that's an interesting fact because it has two different multiplicative structures that happen to agree. And that's the reason you know it's commutative. It's like the Ekman-Hilton argument. But um, a priori, the way you show it has an algebra structure is that uh, the sphere is both a co-algebra and an algebra because it's the monoidal unit. OK. Anyway, maybe I should just yeah, yeah. let sorry. Zach no, no, it's, whatever he sorry. wants to Sorry, I, I definitely no. should. Sorry. <laughs> All right, sorry, Zach. <laughs> Is this just a general fact that if you have a HOM between R modules, then that might not have its own R module structure and the X might not as well? Yeah, that, that's what I was originally trying to say, but maybe, but it sounds like Sean is saying maybe it does have the structure for some other reason. But I, I, I don't think it does because it's not something that I've ever heard talk about. But I think for maps over a hop algebra, for some reason, I feel like that should have something else, but that may require extra structure on the domain and co-domain um, more than just a module structure over Hopf algebra, if that makes sense. Anyway, sorry, it's not germane. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I think what will happen later, the only structure I end up using, I th yeah, so what I end up doing is identifying these with X and then the, the terms in the X themselves will be modules for that. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I, I, somehow as I was working through this, I think it's actually maybe most useful to go through this like ahistorically to like start with the most uh, general one and then see how it specializes. Um, so we're gonna have to restrict to a certain category of spectra, um, finite type and bounded below. It's finite type, it's just um, each uh, homology group should be finally generated in each degree. Bounded below just says there's some cutoff below which um, the homotopy groups vanish. Um, and that can be in some negative degree, that's fine. Um, but sort of the, the most general statement of this is that if you have two, uh, two spectra and you have any cohomology theory, then the way the spectral sequence will go is that you'll have an E2 page, E2SC, it'll be X over E star E. Um, it'll reverse the order that e, it'll be an X between E star B and E star A. And this thing, well, convergence will actually kind of depend on which, which E you choose. But if it converges, it'll converge to homotopy classes of well, almost A and B, except for it's you're gonna have to localize at E first. And the grading you'll pick up is T minus S. I think this needs some conditions on E. Like oh, it really? satisfies okay. the Adams condition or something. Um, there's one you can do in, fair, in a fair amount of generality where you can identify the E1 page. Um, but uh, yeah, that's. That's probably the right thing to write. Is that uh, is this more about the, the convergence or just like that the spectral sequence exists at all? It's about identifying the E2 page with X. Uh, yes. And that the and that it's related to the localization. Cool, cool. Um Oh yeah, I just put a couple of notes over here, just on annotation. Just one thing is that the A and the B get swapped here. Um, and then that the C star E is essentially just the E endomorphism ring um, in the category spectra up to like a, a negative uh, grading. Okay, so we can we can pick a, a nice cohomology theory, say um, HFB, so you have mod B um, singular cohomology. Um, so H star X will just be a singular cohomology of X with FB, and I'll just write H star X for the FB cohomology for the rest, rest of the talk. And in this case, what you'll get is 
the two page will not be X over the mod P C naught algebra. Um, and I'll leave off the P here just because we're working with a P the entire time. And we'll probably take P equals two pretty quickly. Um, in this case, um, and that fact about localization earlier, what you're going to get is homotopy classes between A and the, the P completed version of B. And then finally, if you, if you just take both A and B to be the sphere spectrum, um, you have to kind of identify what is this cohomology ring for the sphere spectrum. Um, maybe not too bad. Just once you run through it, you can compute it as homotopy classes of maps. Um, so you can extract this nth grading by moving the, the suspension in. And if you have this kind of thing, then you're really just computing, say, the negative nth homotopy group of HFP. But this is just has homotopy supported in one degree, so it's just an equals zero. Um, so in any case, the cohomology ring is just one FP in, in degree zero for this. Um, and then the other thing you, you kind of check is that there's another way to write the, the decompleted version of the, the sphere once you take homotopy groups of this thing. Um, what kind of falls out of it is that you get the homotopy groups, the stable homotopy groups of spheres, and then you tensor with um, Z completed at P. All of that to say, what you get out at the end of the day is that this X group is X over A of FP in itself, converging to stable homotopy groups of spheres up to a P completion. Uh, okay, so next, I guess we'll we'll start getting into the details of, of how to construct this. But um, are there any questions before I I jump into that, or comments or anything? There are some questions in the chat. Oh, okay. I'm not I'm not keeping a close eye on it. No, it's fine. It's impossible to do both. So for connective spectra. L localized at E just looks like localizing at primes or completing, basically depending on what the homotopy groups of E look like. That was one of the comments. So if E is connective, um, then localization with respect to E is I think the same as localizing uh, with respect to pi naught of E. Is that what you... And then it just is an effect on the homotopy. Is that what you meant, Liam? Yeah, I mean, so all I'm just saying is that localization with respect to certain spectra is like really simple. Um, it, it's not clear. It's in fact like a theorem of of Bauer's field um, that that this is that this is true, and it, it depends on something called the acyclicity type of the of the group of your homotopy groups, basically, um, if you're connective. Um, that's, I was just trying to say that like, for a large class of spectra, localization is relatively simple. Um, that's basically. So, so I'll, I'll jump into, um, yeah, trying to define this, this atom sour. Um, right, so, so what this is, is you, you pick your, your favorite spectrum and we'll define this atom sour. Uh, Okay, I wrote X here, that should be Y. Uh, so essentially uh, the bottom part of the tower, I'm just writing it sideways, uh, will just be your space. And you'll have some sequence of maps over it, Y1 mapping in, Y2 mapping in, uh, such that each uh, three of these will form a cofiber sequence. So J0 is the cofiber of I0, the homotopy cofiber, and J1 is the homotopy co cofiber of I1, and so on. Um, sub subject to some conditions. So yeah, just that these are the homotopy cofibers is fine. Um, you actually want these maps between these Ys to all become zero once you take homology. Uh, once you take homology, you want all of these cofibers to form a projective resolution. Well, okay, at this stage, I'll just say I want them to be uh, projective A modules. And there's also going to be a condition that they're going to be induced isomorphisms from homotopy classes of maps. So you can let X be any spectrum now. If you're mapping into one of these cofibers, um, that should be the same as uh, taking HOMs in A mod out of this, this cofiber. Uh, and the way Barnes wrote time for this is that uh, these JNs should be sort of like Eilenberg McLean objects for A. Um, 
And the, the claim is, is that, you know, you can, you can build such tower for any, um, for any spectrum subject to the conditions from earlier. Okay, so let's, let's see how this goes. Um, pull up my notes just to make sure with this uh, right here. So yeah, the first thing you do is you start off with, um, so we're just gonna uh, do this for, for HFP. And we're also just going to do it for the sphere spectrum. And then what will happen later is that if you want to do this for an arbitrary spectrum, you can just kind of take this whole construction, smash your spectrum into it, and carry everything around. Um, so you kind of start off with, um, I guess there are a couple of ways to think of this map as a map from the sphere spectrum into HFP. Um, you can think of this as just like this is maybe like the one of the maps coming from the monoidal structure on spectra. Uh, there's a way to think of this as like inclusion of a bottom cell into HFP. Um, but you sort of have this map naturally floating around, and you can just take its homotopy cofiber, or homotopy, if we want this to be a fiber. And we'll write um, E for, for this thing just to save ourselves some notation here. And then E var will be the, this, this fiber. And the claim is that the, the following tower uh, works. So you take Y and be able to resolve it by E bar and then two smash copies of E bar and three smash copies of E bar and so on. So something that maybe sort of looks like a, like a bar or a cobar resolution. Um, and it's just a matter of figuring out what the the cofibers um, of these maps are. And so my claim here is that this will be uh, E, this will be E smash E bar, this will be E smash two smash copies of E bar, and so on and so forth. And uh, it's, it's not too bad to actually get a handle on, on what these maps are and to just compute these cofibers. Um, kind of the way you do it is we had this kind of sequence to start off with. E bar mapping into the sphere spectrum, mapping into E, just uh, by definition. And so just take this whole thing and smash it with, um, I guess, E bar on the right. And so we'll pick up E bar smash two. Um, here I'll just use that when I smash this with E bar, I just get an E bar back. And I get an E smash bar. And so this is, uh, I think I'll label this, this will be, I think, I1 corresponding to this I1 there. And uh, I guess this one here is already our I0 corresponding to this I naught up here. And so we've already identified this fiber, the cofiber with that cofiber, and this cofiber with that cofiber. And you can just kind of keep uh, inductively doing this. And one way to think about this is just smash it with E bar, uh, the end smash copies of it. And uh, up to getting the indexing right. Let me see. I think this this gives us n plus one in the cofiber. Uh, in there and in in copies there. I'm sorry. E, yeah. So n plus one copies in the fiber and then in copies in the, the cofiber. And hopefully that's that's what we have. So call this I N. And that's what will give you the, the rest of these maps and tell you that these are the, the right cofibers. And so yeah, the, the remark here, hopefully I have it down here. If you want to get a tower for A, um, just in, in this entire construction, just keep a, a copy of A, smash everything around, um, or maybe something smash A, depending on 
and you might have to put it on the left or the right or something, but. Okay, so the, the next stage of this is that once we have this, this atom sour, um, we want to try to cook up uh, an exact couple out of this in order to produce a spectral back? sequence. Can we go oh, back to the setup to see that it this does satisfy that list of conditions? Was, mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah, so we, we do get uh, this one. I guess this one is probably not so clear. It, it, it's related to the maps and the diagram, it, like the specific Adams Tower you chose or constructed, and facts about um, cohomology, right? That you have a Kunith isomorphism. So this is equivalent to something called the Amateur complex or the Kobar complex which comes up in commutative algebra and you just sort of because you know that the Steenrod algebra is a augmented FP algebra I guess and some other things about the algebra structure that certain maps are going to be subjective therefore these maps are zero. This also gives condition four in some sense. I think that's not completely obvious, but. Condition three? Uh, it's also, um, because you took the, because the E bar thing is the, you have a Kuna theorem and this E bar thing is a cofiber. So um, you're sort of just splitting off the bottom piece so I think you know that the cohomology of the E bar thing is a, a sum end of a free. Okay, that's that summation split somehow. Yeah, I think that's is that right. I don't know. That's the, what's coming to mind right now. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm thanks. all over the place. So if if you all like, there's a much uh, there's a more sort of ad hoc way to do this where in it, you, you pick each of the JIs to be a wedge of copies of, of HFP that's large enough to, um, so that its cohomology surjects onto the cohomology of the corresponding Y. Um, and then if that map is a surjection on cohomology, then the I's induce zero in cohomology. Um, and I don't know, maps, you can identify maps into a wedge of HFPs with, with maps on cohomology. Um, so that's that, what Zach is doing is like a more sort of a more sophisticated version of that, I guess. So I saw um, I couldn't find details spelled out for this, but it sounds like this is this is some kind of like killing homology construction. And I read somehow that this is supposed to be kind of somehow similar to like a like a Postnagop tower where the, the things are like wedges of uh, more spaces or something when you kill off the homotopy. That, so that's what Ebo was just saying in the chat. Um, oh, really? <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I couldn't find I, I think it was pretty similar. Out, though. I mean, asking, not saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, so in, yeah, I don't know. Maybe this is getting getting off topic. But in, in, in Mosher and Tangora, they talk about this way of computing the homotopy groups of spheres by like writing down the Posnikov towers of all the spheres and, and doing some kind of complicated inductive argument that uses knowledge of the cohomology of the eilenberg mclean spaces that appear in the towers. And this, I, I think this is like kind of what inspired the out of spectral sequence. So Bob explicitly mentions this kind of thing in section one of his primer on the atom spectral sequence. He sort of goes through doing the Bosnikov tower computation for computing the homotopy groups of spheres. And then at the end of the first section, he, he starts talking about how you get the atom spectral sequence by trying to kill all of the homotopy that cohomology can see at each stage. So that, that's a possible reference. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I will say that while I was reading up on this, like the, the literature is kind of all over the place. I think there are like, about like six or seven different ways to do this. 
they're all like slightly different, different conditions, even on like the Adams Tower. Some people only require um, that these maps and four are just surjections. Um, some people only require like two conditions that I think imply some of these others. So uh, fun, fun times. Okay, so uh, okay, so we have we have this kind of situation here where um, we sort of have a, have a collection of cofiber sequences like this um, that are kind of interlocked in the sense that y n plus one is here, but you know one stage up in the tower you'll have y n plus one and y n plus two with another cofiber. Um, so that's a hint that maybe like an um, like an exact couple might work in this situation. Um, so what you do is you you take one of these these cofiber sequences you can just apply. Uh, pick your favorite spectrum, apply the functor sort of homing from that spectrum into this, this sequence. Um, by some, some business about, you know, you can do sort of do the, the pupae sequence and, and spectra. Um, maybe messing around with some covariance versus contravariance, you can extend this out into a, a long exact sequence because now you've gone from the stable homotopy category into something that's like abelian groups or graded abelian groups. So you get some kind of long exact uh, sequence between the classes of maps. And uh, what you do is you kind of just sum all of these up over n. So uh, here we're taking, uh, yeah, how do I wanna, this, this is what you get kind of at, at the end of the day. Sum over n of classes of maps of x into yn plus one uh, into, well, you have a yn over here, essentially coming from this and this. Um, but once you sum over n, you can identify these, they're just off by one shift. Um, so I can, in fact, just go in and erase this n plus one here. And from this, get that kind of thing. And uh, the boundary map that it kind of gets you back is just coming from these, assembling all of these boundary maps in the, along, along these X sequences together. Okay, so at least you have uh, some exact couple coming out of this. Um, all right, so I included just a little bit of, of background just on exact couples. Um, maybe just kind of point out like some of what the general theory, theory is. Uh, in general, like once you have an exact couple, um, you can kind of produce a spectral sequence out of it. But I wanted to at least show how you kind of like, it's, it's an inductive procedure. And I want to show how you like turn the crank for the first, first step. So the, the general sort of theory is that if you have an exact couple of this form where this, these top two complexes are the same, you have some different complex down here. Essentially, you're going to um, get a drive couple by kind of taking homology of, of this whole thing. Um, and you'll get a new exact couple out of that. So you can just run the same thing on it. Um, and so just how this, this goes, like roughly this will be like what gets you started. And then this first derived couple will be uh, thyro D1. I'm not sure it might be off by an indexing something here, but this is going to be one of the pages of the spectral sequence essentially. Um, I'll just mention kind of how it goes. Exactness is just that the composite of any two of these maps is zero. Um, so you'll use that at some point. To define this new exact couple, you have this map up here. And so on the top, you just kind of restrict it to its image. Uh, you define a differential um, essentially as k composed j, which will take you from b back to b. Um, yeah, I guess that's what I'm doing here is just restrict this i to the images boundary map on B is going to be um, this J composed K. You can take homology with respect to that boundary map as long as you show that D squared is zero. These two maps here, there's like a J, J tilde and a K tilde. Um, I won't say too much about them except for that they're, they're just sort of induced by these, these J's and these K's in kind of an obvious way. Um, essentially, if you, you wanna do something, if you wanna apply this J tilde to some A prime in this image, you essentially just send it to an equivalent class. And so the only things you have to check is just that, you know, is this kind of thing well-defined? Um, and it all works, it ends up just being a, a diagram chase. Same thing with the, the K tilde, you're mapping out of equivalence classes, so you're choosing representatives. So same kind of check there. Um, yeah, so maybe I won't go through all of this, but I'll just point out that there are like 10 things to check. And then there's also checking exactness of this, this new couple you get. Uh, it's like a very, very long exercise. It's spelled out at least partially in, in bottom two if you want to go uh, look through that. But uh, the way this kind of goes is that you'll set ER 
So once you know that this thing is a new exact couple, now you can just apply the same construction again. So you said ER to be sort of the homology of the previous exact couple with the, the boundary map you define this way, and you get pages of a spectral sequence out of it. Okay, so what we're going to try to do now is uh, we want to eventually get to E2. So I'm going to try to tell you what E1 is and um, say something about what the actual uh, differential on this thing is. Um, so that way we can know E2 is going to be homology with respect to this, this new differential. So quick note is that we had, this was our exact couple. We were summing up all of these classes of maps um, and the cofibers were appearing down here. Um, if you kind of unravel what this exact couple is giving you, um, is it was sort of assembled out of these, these cofiber sequences, uh, you're getting, say, in, in the ST uh, graded part, you're getting maps from a suspension mess of this S cofiber. Um, in the T is position, this is what you, what you end up with on the E1 page. Um, I'll just point out that you can identify this with a couple of things. Um, so this, this T, you can move it up to a suspension here. Or conversely, you can move this suspension down here to a negative grading. And this is kind of where the, the T minus S thing is coming up in the E2 page. Um, just because T minus S is sort of already showing up in the E minus in the E1 page. And then by the way, this this thing over here with the T minus S, this is what we asked to, to map isomorphically onto the, the, the HOMS. So if you kind of look at the E1 page, um, sort of here's what you have have. Um, I have an S direction going up, T direction going off the side. So I'm letting the T uh, be the index of the um, this like graded uh, complex of maps. So this whole thing is, is this complex. And the S's are corresponding to like which suspension and which cofiber you take. And we want to figure out, so the differential should just go straight up. So we need to figure out a way to get from the uh, you know, suspend in JN to suspend in plus one, JN plus one. Uh, okay, and the way you do this, <laughs> hopefully this will make some sense. Um, you essentially do this by, by splicing together a bunch of, of cofiber sequences. Let me see if I can spell out how this works. Um, so over here on the, on the left-hand side, um, these are just sort of the original cofiber sequences we, we started out with, just coming from the Adams Tower. And the Adams Tower itself is, is just given by this, this green business here. Um, these straight lines are just equality. Um, same, same deal here. Um, they'll just be equality here. So like these, these, all of these cofiber sequences are already kind of braided together in some way. And that's gonna that's gonna help us. And so what I've done here is just across each line, I've I've taken the long um, cofiber sequence off to the right for each one. So setting off, spending everything as I go this way. And these, these bars are just telling you, like, here's three terms that are together. And so what we need for our differential is to get from something like J naught down here to suspend one J1. And the way you can do that is just follow the sequence for a while, use this equality, and follow that sequence. And if you want to do it for a different degree, you need to go from J1 to suspend one. Uh, or right, this should be suspend. Uh, let's see, what do we want here? Oh, I see. we need to go from suspend in JN to suspend in plus one, JN plus one. The way you can do that is start uh, here. And just sort of do the same thing, follow it up there. And so you just assemble these. I've just done it here at one level. Your d squared is something that's going to go from j naught to suspend to j2. And one thing you can notice is that um, in the middle here, you're traversing three terms in one long cofiber sequence. So that thing will be null, uh, null homotopic. That's kind of where the d squared equals zero is coming from. And then once you have these maps on the, the j's themselves, um, we needed maps right from these um, like homotopy classes of maps. So you just kind of take the, the differential to be, so you have one from J's to suspend J's, um, and then you apply maps, you apply uh, 
that functor to that differential to get the new one. So, and so this this pink differential here is this one appearing that uh, moves you up in the U1 page. Uh, okay. So now that we, we have the U1 page, uh, we'd like to know, uh, we'd like to identify E2 in two different ways. Um, so yeah, the, the way we want to do now is identify this with some uh, X group in A. So just from that, the differential we got from the splicing the cofiber sequences, if you just start off with the, the base of your tower, um, yeah, you at least have this differential that kind of maps you up through all of the, the various suspensions. So just take, um, take homology of this, this whole tower. And what you actually have now is H star Y is appearing at the bottom. And uh, these are all projective modules by assumptions on the Adams tower. So you're actually getting a, a projective resolution of H star Y uh, coming from this stuff. And it, I mean, there's a little technicality here, like you're really seeing H star suspend N, J, N, but you can use um, I don't know, stability of homology or something to identify this with a shifted version of the homology of um, just J by itself. So if that thing was projective, then hopefully that thing is too. Okay, so now just kind of re-identifying some of what we see on the E1 page. We're seeing a HOM in the category of A modules between uh, some homology of some suspension of one of these cofibers to H star X. Um, once we take homology, it, it flips the order. And uh, yeah, so here are the S's and T's. So I guess I'm looking at sort of EST here. And so the question is, what is the E2 term at this page? And it's going to be sort of by definition, you're taking homology with respect to um, this differential. And so you're going to get, um, I guess that's all, that's all I'm saying here is E2 is just homology of everything you saw above with respect to that differential. And then the claim is that this is actually, um, I've, I've written equal here because I think this is this is literally the way you would compute the X of H star Y and H star X if you were in the category of A modules. Um, and the reason for that is that we're, we're essentially just computing the, the derived functors of, um, you know, this F, F weight is just palm into H star X. And so we've just, we found a projective resolution of this other object, we've applied the functor to it. Now we're taking homology of that thing. So we're just computing the, the X. Oh, and there's there's a little thing that tripped me up here and that um, this is not the usual way, I guess you compute X, but uh, because normally you would want to have the thing here and have the, the, the open slot on the right and then you would take injective resolutions or something. But uh, it works out if you if you take the slot and projective resolutions, that's that's the right thing to do. Uh, okay, I think we're you know, we're just about done. So I just want to go through an example of how you use this. So this, this gives us essentially the, the result that we wanted, which was the C two really is uh, an X between these two things. So I'll just point out some some remarks that came up in Barnes and Um One is that the convergence of this seems to heavily depend on what E you take, what homology theory. Um, so for these um, Johnson Wilson theories. It's discovered in, so the convergence of this spectral sequence is covered in Hovey Strickland. Um, and this seems like the kind of thing that you might want to compute often, like you see the L lower EN thing showing up a lot, localizing there. Um, if you take E to be like MU or one of these Brown Peterson spectra, which uh, I'm told is supposed to be like a P local version of MU, uh, then you get sort of a, this uh, other spectral sequence, sometimes called the Adams Novikov spectral sequence. Um, there's a sort of this Tom reduction map, which goes from BP to HFP. Um, and it turns out that this induces a, a morphism of spectral sequences between the Adams Novikov spectral sequence and uh, the Adams spectral sequence we have here. And there's also some sort of like comparison theorems on like, um, you know, if you have filtrations coming from the spectral sequence that are bounded by a length of N, then you can kind of um, bound the, the lengths of filtrations in the Adams Novikov as well. And then the claim uh, is that you know roughly this this goes through goes through for any cohomology theory E I guess maybe with some conditions probably need to qualify this a lot. 
So roughly the same construction is what's used. And uh, you get the localization on that side instead. But you also get the, the same kind of X just over a potentially different, um, yeah, X in a, in a potentially different category. OK, so to try to look at some of the, the one line for this, if you take um, X and Y to be the sphere, sphere spectrum, and you take HF2 to be your cohomology theory. Um, and so what the, the spectral sequence states is that the E2 page should be X over the mod P16 rod algebra of F2 um, against itself. And this thing should converge to the two complete uh, stable homotopy groups of spheres. And the claim is, is that um, if you just look at the, the one line of the E2 page, it's like an X to one T, what you get are, um, so it's that an F2 algebra where it's generated on these uh, generators H sub I um, for, so there'll be an H sub I supported in every degree of two to the I, it'll just be zero sort of elsewhere. Um, and I'll tell you what these H, H sub I's are, they'll come up in the proof. Uh, so the way this goes is that we, we use the fact that this is an, an X. Um, so any class in here is giving us an equivalence class of extensions in this category, A mod. So it corresponds to something like this. Um, so there's an F2 on either side. Um, this F2 over here ends up being shifted by T. And there's some sort of unknown um, A module in the middle. And then it's just a, a question of like, what possibilities can, can we even have for this, this module M? Uh, all right, so yeah, this F2S notation or F2T, it's just telling you that there's an F2 um, in degree S generated by um, some elements of, of degree S. Uh, so what I'm, I'm gonna use here is that um, I, I think of A modules, they're, they have an underlying FP module structure. Um, so I can I can think about this sequence and how it splits as FP modules, and then this is kind of like a standard thing when you have like algebras, you know, over a vector space or something. It's like you can have things split in the underlying vector space because homological algebra over vector spaces is, is kind of easy. These will all be like free, or you know, you only need them to be projective. So all of these will split, um, but then they might not split once you add on a different, a, you know, additional algebra structure on top of that. Um, yeah, so this. Yeah, F2 is certainly a free F2 module over itself. So you can, you can get a splitting of this sequence in the, the category if you forget the A module structure. Um, and so you can, you can sort of compute the, the F2 rank of this thing that way, um, just because you'll get a direct sum and a direct sum of F2s uh, up to some degree shifts. So it'll be F2 generated on two elements, one in degree zero and one in degree uh, T for some T. Uh, but you know, this is just telling you as a as a an F2 vector space, it's dimension two. Uh, but of course, this might not split in the larger category. Um, so what we'll try to do is sort of um, now use the structure of the scene rod algebra to um, more finely thin down what possibilities extension for extensions we could have. Um, and the claim is is that there's a correspondence um, between these. Um, classes of extensions in this X group um, and say elements Q in the scene rod algebra uh, where the degree is T. This thing was like F2 adjoint T, F2, or sorry, F2 in degree T and then F2 in degree zero. Um, and the action of Q has to send the degree zero generator to the degree two generator. Um, and I have to think about uh, why exactly this correspondence is true. Um, but one, one immediate kind of thing to pull out of this is that this forces to be Q, forces Q to be one of these like decomposable elements of this you know, algebra that Liam talked about uh, in his talk. Um, and it's just a quick proof by contradiction. You can you know, assume your thing actually does decompose um, as two different things. Um, and both of these satisfy the same property that they send the degree zero generator to the degree S generator. Um, or sorry, I phrased that. Uh, this is Q sends the degree zero to degree S, but it's decomposable where neither of these two send the degree zero to the degree S. That's what this is saying here. Um, 
So now if you apply Q to this degree zero generator, um, yeah, so I apply Q to X naught, then it's Q1, Q2, X naught. And if this is an XS, or this, this is XS, um, this thing has to be equal to Q1, X naught prime, where X naught is not, X naught prime is not XS. Um, the long story short of this is that you can cook up a third generator out of this. Um, and so you get a, you know, a span of at least three generators sitting inside of your module. So the rank is at least three. Uh, as again, if you just forget the A module structure and drop to F2, um, then you get a rank three module. And so that's too big, so it can't happen. So all of these queues have to be indecomposable. And we know the indecomposables uh, in, in this uh, module. So they're just squares, seam rod squares of the form uh, two to the K, where K is K ranges over positive integers. And so now we have this correspondence between everything on the one line, these X1s and these square two Ks, um, where these square two Ks, we'll just send them to whatever they correspond to and we'll call those things HKs. And so uh, this is just kind of a picture of the E1, kind of what you what you end up getting here. Um, so there's an H, H naught in degree one, H1 in degree two, H2 in degree two squared, H3 in degree two cubed, H4 in degree two to the fourth. Um, and it turns out, I, I don't know if this is an easy or a hard theorem, but these first uh, four happen to be permanent cycles. And I think this, this uh, H4 is not. Uh, and uh, these actually have some like geometric meaning. Um, so what happens is that this, this H1, this, this H0, uh, just kind of listed out these elements and where they're falling in the E1 page. If you just kind of look at what total degree they land in, um, you can kind of sort of figure out where if they if they survive the infinity page, what you know degree of the stable homotopy of spheres would they fall into? Um, and you kind of work it out and you find that it's you know one, three, zero, one, three, and seven, which are kind of like pretty special numbers. Uh, so these these are related to the sort of classical theorems about these being the only parallelizable uh, spheres. Um, and this I know less about, so maybe someone knows more. <laughs> But I think so these these are called the, the Hopf elements. Is that actually correct? Okay. So these these come from geometry and in some other way, um, and they survived the infinity page. And I think I just have one more page of comments. I actually did okay on timing. It's not bad. Um, yeah, just just some some quick remarks on um, other things that happen on this one line. Um, so if you want to try to compute um, you know, two lines and higher, uh, it seems like this is generally much harder than the one line. Um, it, uh, so Parnes and Wertheim sort of say that the way you do this is uh, you, you want to cook up resolutions, projective resolutions of FP as a module over this mod P scene rod algebra. And in principle, um, the way you can do this is to use these sort of ADEM relations uh, to get these resolutions. And then uh, even if you have that, there are sort of a bunch of choices for all these different kinds of resolutions. There are these minimal resolutions, which have you know, a very small number of generators, which is pretty nice. Um, you can do these bar resolutions, which are more combinatorial. Um, and these also happen to pick up some, some extra structure on the stable homotopy of spheres. So it seems like these can detect you know, product structures and total brackets, these kinds of things. Um, and I just wanted to mention why the E2 page is, I mean, the E, I'm sorry, the, the E2 page, the one line is like already interesting, uh, but there's like a lot of other interesting stuff in that page as well. Um, so I think, you know, this, this Kavir invariant problem is sort of one of my favorites. And I think this amounts to those, those um, HIs, you can multiply them up the new generators, H sub I squared. And you can ask, of course, are those permanent cycles? Do those get killed by a differential at some point? Um, and apparently some part of this like Kavir invariant one problem boils down to checking down if these, these HN squareds are permanent cycles. And I uh, don't know what the status of this is. I imagine this is, if there's anything, it's, it's pretty recent. So they, um, it's known now that they are up to n equals five okay. and n equals six is unknown. And from seven onward, they're not permanent cycles. 
So uh, in H6 squared lives in dement, uh, homotopy degree 126. So if anyone feels like calculating the atom spectral sequence out that far, you, you would have a great paper on your hands. You would get a job wherever you wanted if you did that, I think. So, so the, this the thing about the- they're, they're known not to be permanent cycles? Correct. Right. This right. is Hill Hopkins Ravenel. I see, I see. The stuff about the bar resolution having extra structure is not exactly true. All, I, it's easiest to see it that way, but because the bar resolution has it and it's equivalent to a minimal resolution, the minimal resolution will also have it. Oh, I see. By the comparison theorem of homological algebra. Don't you also need the minimal resolution to have like a multiplicative structure or something? You, I thought that was. It does have one. It does. Right? Okay. Because the bar resolution, I mean, any resolution does. If you're resolving an algebra, then the comparison theorem from homological algebra tells you that a projective resolution also has an algebra structure because you lift the product map. Okay. Because a tensor product of, pro of projective modules is projective. Okay. Is that, that's somehow I didn't know that. That's, yeah, that's cool. so the comparison theorem, the one where if you have two, you just have a map between two things and you take their projective resolutions and you lift that to a chain map. Is that you actually only need a map out of a projective complex into an exact complex. Oh, okay. okay. Because the tensor square of a projective resolution is not exact, but it is still a projective complex. Thanks. So the, the only other thing I was going to mention is I tried to uh, to run through some of the spectral sequence where you, know, you just take these elements. It's a I don't know if it's obvious that there's a theorem, but there's a product structure on E two. Um, it's kind of the same way in the Sayre spectral sequence. You can just kind of start multiplying elements together and see where they land. And then if you have a bunch of things landing in the same spot, um, then you kind of get relations out of that. Uh, if you just start freely taking this stuff on the E1 line and multiplying it out, uh, you can get a lot. <laughs> but I guess, the, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to tell how many of those are actually like, are they cycles that get killed by a differential immediately or survive or something? But yeah, so there, I, don't, I don't know how, how valid this, this kind of computation is. So some of those things I think aren't there, but right. So for example, H naught times H1 is zero. I see, I see. So all of uh, the vertical bars coming off of anything diagonal are, are, are zero. Um, that's, how, how does one show this kind of thing? Um, I think you, so there are two ways of, sorry, so this there is are three thing. ways, there are three this ways here. Of, sorry, which one? Yeah, that H, one. H nine times H one. Yep. That's zero. And so everything above it is zero. Um, oh, nice. Okay. And then similarly, right. Since, um, since H naught squared is a multiple, since H1 squared is a multiple of H1, that vertical tower vanishes as well. Uh, looking at this one? Mm -hmm. And then the one after that as well. Any, anything above this line? Yeah. <laughs> so there's um, three ways to represent elements in X. And for each of them, you can, sorry, three ways. There are two ways to represent elements in X in terms of either co-cycles, like maps out of the resolution, or in terms of extensions. Um, and then there are three ways then to represent the products. And the easiest way to compute the product is probably by using composition of co-cycles and just looking at the minimal resolution. And because it's only on the two line, it's not hard. And the particular relevant parts of it are um, look like the extension representatives you wrote down. Um, 
I don't know. I, I don't feel like what I'm saying is actually clear unless one starts drawing pictures. So I apologize. But but computing that H not H1 is zero is uh, not particularly hard. Yeah, I would I would also add that this is like a really good use, I think, of the main spectral sequence because H0 times H1 is like the target of one of the first differentials. Um, and like, as with a lot of things in the main spectral sequence, you can actually compute it, so. So fortunately, we have, a, I think, at least one, maybe two other talks coming up about doing these computations. So, um, so we will actually be able to prove some of these statements. I hope. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to throw it out there in case anybody runs across anything on it. Um, but yeah, like somehow um, this this was stated as kind of a given in Barnes work time that this you know first stable homotopy to complete it is is cyclic of order two. But I don't really know. Like, do you, do you have to prove this by other methods to know that this thing? to know this this equality here at the end like some, some I think this that is class is, is simple enough that you can prove that kind of statement geometrically but you can also like the conversation we were just having is kind of converging to to a proof of it um let me see if you know so those those h0 multiplications that you are drawing um tell you about multiplication by two in the homotopy groups so you if, if you know that h0 times h1 is 0 on the e2 page, then you, you know that 2 times eta is 0 in the, um, in the homotopy groups. Nice. OK, OK. Yeah. And also, since you know that pi 0 of the sphere is the integers of the two addicts, <clears throat> you know that that eta can't support a differential. So it's a permanent cycle. If you if you go back to the picture, I think maybe that's clear then. So you've got that red dot, and any differential on it goes one column to the left and one or two or three up. Uh, I see. All those maps have to be zero because otherwise you wouldn't get the integers in pi naught. I think you're going the wrong way, Zach. Um, you're going to the right, not to the left. Oh, I see, I see. So you just go one column to the left and then up two and that's D2. I see. And if that were non-zero, if that differential were non-zero, then pi naught of the sphere would be z mod eight. Or oh, nice. But it's not. So all right. So it survives that page. So then d three go up one more. Well, it's not z mod sixteen. So so it's a permanent cycle, and it's just a single copy of f two. It's just coming from up here on the next page, and. There on yep. the next one. Yep. So we also get from this pi two is z mod two because all those white dots above uh, eta squared vanish as well. Does that make sense? I'm gonna try. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I'm gonna have to try like running, writing through the next page or two, and like actually. Well, there's going there's the nowhere for the differential on on the h1 squared. There's nowhere for that differential to go. It can only go one column to the right and up, and everything is zero there. Oh, I see. Sorry, I see. one column to the left. One column to the left. Sorry. Yeah, so it's just landing here. Exactly, and there's nothing there because all of those h1 multiples were zero, and the reason those h1 multiples are zero. Uh, is this uh, May spectral sequence differential that Jacob was talking about? I mean, you you can either compute it with the product structure on X, or you can 
compute it with the May spectral sequence, but those two things are, are really equivalent because the May spectral sequence differentials are coming from the product structure or if you're doing the Zulstein red algebra, the co-algebra structure. So I'm sure people have a lot more questions, but why don't we give Zach uh, a round of applause? Uh, so thanks a lot, Zach.